Let's look at a few examples of slope fields and see what we can observe about them. And these examples have all been drawn for us, so we'll tend to, as much as possible, avoid the tedious problem of drawing a slope field by hand. It's more interesting to observe them and draw conclusions from them. So our first example is the differential equation y prime equals negative 2y. And it may be hard to see this slope field, but if we zoom in we can see the behavior of it more or less. And again we can think about if we start plotting solutions here, it all depends on what our initial condition is as to what specific solution we'll see. If for instance we start up here with our initial condition, our solution would look something like this. If on the other hand we started down here somewhere, our solution would look more like this. But we can get a sense of these different solutions and all the different curves that would result with different initial conditions just by drawing one slope field. So there's a lot of information packed in here and we can observe a lot about this solution even if we don't have any idea what the exact answer would be yet. But notice a few things about this differential equation. First of all, there's one interesting note that if you look along a horizontal line here, all of the slopes are going to be the same. Right? These slopes are all consistent. And if we pick a different y value, again, the slopes are all consistent along that horizontal line. Now why is that? Well, if you look again at the differential equation itself, y prime equals negative 2y, notice that the slopes only depend on the value of y. So as x or t varies, it doesn't have any impact on the slopes. Only different values of y lead to different slope values. So this is an example of one that's called an autonomous differential equation because the slopes only depend on y. That's just kind of an interesting note that we can use to identify uh, slope fields. It's not a very common thing to point out, but it's kind of interesting just to notice that that happens to be autonomous. The more interesting thing about this one, and the one that we're going to focus on with most of these examples, is the behavior at the end of this problem. If you think about moving to the right on this picture, that's like moving forward in time. And all of these curves that we draw are settling down to the same point. In other words, the end behavior of all of these solutions, if we drew many more solutions, they would all trend toward zero as time moves forward. What that means is that there's an equilibrium solution or a steady state solution at y equals zero. And equilibrium solutions are incredibly important and we're going to talk more about them with the other examples we'll do in just a minute. But that idea that the end behavior is predictable based on this slope field is important and it's all based on the equilibrium solutions. Now notice why that's true. If you look at this differential equation and we ask the question when would that slope y prime equal zero? Well it would equal zero when negative 2y equals zero which of course happens when y equals zero. So that tells us right away that there's an equilibrium at y equals zero and the fact that everything is trending toward it isn't necessarily always true with equilibrium solutions, but equilibrium solutions are ones where the slopes are zero along that horizontal line. So an equilibrium solution is a horizontal line where all the slopes are zero, so there's a flat line there. Let me highlight that on the graph. So equilibrium solutions are an important piece to look for when you look at a slope field. Let's take that and look at the second example. This one is y prime equals y times 3 minus y. 
Now before we even look at the graph, let's see if we can figure out where the equilibrium solutions should be. If we set this equal to zero, if we're looking for where the slope equals zero, we can solve this and find that y either equals zero or three, and those are the equilibrium solutions. Sure enough, if we look at the graph, we should notice a flat line at zero and one at three. And if we zoom in here, notice that at zero, we've got flat slopes, and at three, we've got the same thing. So those are our two equilibrium solutions. And you can actually use that to identify which slope field matches which equation. If you look at a differential equation and you can pick out what the equilibrium solution should be, and then you have a set of slope fields to pick from, you can figure out which slope field matches that equation based on which slope field has the equilibrium solutions at the right place. Now there's one more thing we want to point out with equilibrium solutions, and we can start to observe it here, but we'll use the next problem as well to observe that. So here, if we start at this point in the middle between the two equilibrium solutions, then the solutions will start to increase as we go to the right. And our solution, if we move back in time, would look like this. If we start below the lower equilibrium, our solution would look something like this. And if we started above the top equilibrium, our solution would look something like this. So not only can we pick out the equilibrium solutions, but we can tell where the solution would be increasing and decreasing. And to do that, we could also work just from the equation itself without a picture. Let me show you what I mean. Once we know that equilibrium solutions are at zero and three, we could say, okay, above three, let's pick zero, four as an initial condition and see what happens. If we plug in zero, four to our differential equation, now of course the zero doesn't get plugged in anywhere because there's no X's or T's in this differential equation. But if we plug four in, we would have four times three minus four, or four times negative one, which is a negative value, which tells us that above the upper equilibrium, this thing is decreasing. The slope is negative, so it's decreasing. If we look between zero and three, say we pick zero, one as our initial condition. If we plug in one for y, we would have one times three minus one. So one times two, which is positive. So it's increasing. And then below zero, say we pick negative one. If we plug in negative one for y, we'd have negative one times three minus negative one. Negative one times four is negative again. So we can even tell between the equilibrium solutions and then outside those, we can tell which way things are moving. So we can visualize a lot just by thinking about where are the equilibrium solutions and then in the sections between them and beyond them, what is this solution doing? Is it increasing or decreasing? And we can draw even a really simple diagram like this right here that tells us that around three, above it, solutions are coming down, below it, solutions are going up, and then around zero, solutions are going up above it and down below it. And that's the same thing we observe here. Now let's take that one step further. If we look at the equilibrium y equals three, the solutions above it are trending downward toward it, and the solutions below it are trending upward again toward it. So on both sides, solutions are coming down and up toward the equilibrium. Everything's approaching that equilibrium. That's where solutions are trying to get to. But look at what happens at y equals zero. The opposite happens. Above zero, solutions are moving up and away from it. Below zero, 
solutions are moving down and away from it. Everywhere you look, solutions are moving away from this equilibrium. So there are different types of equilibria. There's a equilibrium where solutions come toward it, and there's an equilibrium where solutions go away from it. Let's keep that in mind and look at our last example. This one is y prime equals y times 4 minus y squared. And again, we can zoom in a little bit to get a better view of this. But without even looking at the graph, we should be able to tell where the equilibrium solutions will be. If this equals 0, then we can do a little factoring to double check. But this is true when y equals 0, positive 2, or negative 2. So our equilibrium solutions we expect to be at 0, 2, and negative 2. And again, without looking at the graph, we could do the same sort of thing we did on the last example and see what happens above 2, between 0 and 2, between 0 and negative 2, and below negative 2, and see which direction the graph is moving on each of those sections. But since we have the graph to look at, we can just observe what's happening here. So solutions around 0, above it, they're increasing. Below it, they're decreasing. And then around positive 2, solutions above it are decreasing, solutions below it are increasing, and so on. So we have an equilibrium at y equals 2, y equals 0, and y equals negative 2. And notice that the equilibria at 2 and negative 2 are both ones where the solutions are settling down to that point. They're approaching that equilibrium. At 0, the solutions are traveling away from it. And this again is the same behavior we saw on the last one. And now we're going to get some terminology to describe that. So the terminology we use is we call the first type and stable equilibrium. And that occurs at y equals 2 and negative 2. And we have an unstable equilibrium at y equals 0. And dynamical systems, which is what differential equations tend to describe, have examples of stable and unstable equilibria, and it's important to note the distinction between them. If it helps, think about an example. Say you take a pendulum, and if you've got a pendulum that's pinned at the top, and then you hang something below it. So for instance, a long metal rod that's hanging from a pin at the top. If you leave this alone, it will stay in that position forever. That's a stable equilibrium. If you, on the other hand, pin it at the bottom and you manage to balance it perfectly, it will also stay in that position. That's also an equilibrium. Both of those positions are equilibria. They're both positions where if you manage to get it exactly in that point, it won't change from there. And that's what happens at y equals zero. If the solution ever equals y equals zero, it will continue on that line forever. But there's an important distinction between these two. On the left side, if you move this pendulum slightly and then you let go, the pendulum is going to swing back and forth and eventually settle back to its equilibrium position. In other words, that equilibrium is a position it wants to be in and it will move closer and closer to it and eventually settle down there. On the other hand, if you take the pendulum pinned at the bottom and you disturb it slightly, if you lean it even a tiny bit to one side or the other, it's going to swing away from that position and never return on its own. There's nothing that the system would do to naturally get into that position. It's kind of an unnatural equilibrium where anything slightly deviating from that will cause the system to change drastically away from that point. So that's the difference between a stable and an unstable equilibrium. 
You could also think of a bowl in the same way. If you have a bowl like this and you put a marble in it and let go, the marble will roll and roll and roll and eventually settle down at the base of the bowl. That's a stable equilibrium. If you flip the bowl upside down and you manage to balance the marble on the very top, it'll stay there. But if you let go, it'll roll to one side or the other and never return to that equilibrium position. So not only can we pick out equilibrium solutions, but we can tell a lot about the stability of a system around one equilibrium or another. So if you go on to study differential equations more and you use it to apply to different fields like physics or engineering, the stability of a system is a huge question and one of the most important things you can learn about a differential equation.